Hi, and welcome back with another video about the control synthesis DBase 9. Yes, indeed, I've decided to do a follow up video for the first time. But first, let's have some background music, featuring, of course, the DB9. During the production for my first video about the DB9, that you should definitely check out too, I was lucky to find someone who was involved in the creation of the synth. And as there is hardly any information floating around on the web about it, I made it my duty to preserve for the generations coming the story of the inception of the DBase 9. Why would I do so and why should you watch this video? I have absolutely no idea. But this is my channel so I can do as I please. Also, history is usually written by the winners and this leaves a massive hole as all the losers in history have interesting stories to tell too. Actually, this is something that has fascinated me for a while. The history of less relevant and everyday objects and people is filled with some really fascinating insights into generations past. Did you for example know that being a public toilet used to be an actual job just a few centuries ago? Like not working in one but being in the actual restroom. Anyway, back to the history of the DBase 9. So while trying to unearth some info about the DB9 I found a post on the interwebs claiming that one James Walker was involved in the creation of the synth so I tried to contact James and luckily he didn't only reply but was a very nice guy to begin with. He was also able to answer all the questions I had about the DB9 and gave me some insight into who created it and why and how this was done. So let's start out with the company that commissioned the DBase 9, FX Music Control. From what I can find on the web, the now defunct FX Music Control used to be a company specialized in vintage audio equipment from as early as the late 80s. As you probably all know, vintage synths and music equipment prices these days seem to be absolutely out of control for often increasingly rare cult machines like the Trees or Roland Jupiters. But it isn't something new at all actually, because the different genres of electronic music that were popularized from the early 90s often used 80s and sometimes even 70s analog synths that had by then become unpopular and cheap with the advent of digital synths and samplers in the late 80s. In some cases, like in that of the 303, Yes, I know, this joke gets old over time. The scarcity was increased because it was a very unpopular machine and only sold very few units during its initial release. In other cases, early technology was a bit unreliable, which killed many units early, or they were rather expensive, so not many units were sold upon their original shelf life. So, it seems to have been a good idea to specialize in the sale, repair and service of vintage synths in the 90s already, as there are many synths still available for not yet at ridiculous prices, and electronic music's increasing popularity made sure that there was an ever-growing demand for synths and services. FX Music Control seemed to have made it into the early 2000s, but was probably killed by kids with their laptops filled with illegally downloaded VSTs around 2004. In the early 90s, however, it was still going strong and, as I've suspected in my first DB9 video, felt that it was a good idea to commission a 303 clone of their own because their customers wanted more 303s than they could supply, which I guess is a market situation that will remain for all eternity. Control Synthesis was set up around 1993-1994, about the same time Novation announced their own take on the 303 clone original base station which I have also done a video about that you should definitely check out. James told me that it was designed by Steve Granger and Di Evans, who were at the time senior lecturers at a local university and had a background in medical electronics. They went on to create another synth in the very rare and very cool OS1 original synth. It's a very loudly colored 3 oscillator monometric synth beast that, like the DB9, has little to no info about it on the web. Steve and I created a synth to music control spec, interestingly, music control even involved Roland here a bit, because they had, as a trader in vintage synths, a good business relationship with Roland they didn't want to spoil, so they kind of asked for permission from Roland to avoid it, both with the internal electronics and the design of the synth to copy the 303 directly. So the DB9 ended up the regular we know today. And as the internal electronics were old fashioned, as in big and heavy, they made sure the case fits the specs and had quality cases made by the company that supplies cases to pro audio companies like Drama. This also fit in with the designer's goal to not build a cheap as chips 303 clone like Behringer's TD3, but a modern analog base synth for customers that were used to chunky retro gear. Internally, however, the DS9 was pretty old school. Steve and I had settled for a design featuring a Curtis CEM3374 as the VCO chip that was still widely available back then, and a diode ladder VCF which was from a practical electronics design from the 1970s. As they later discovered, the CEM3374 would have needed constant monitoring by DSC and CPU to keep it in tune, so they modified the design to fit the CEM3340 that was far less capable in terms of features and sound. 
I'm pretty sure in one of those alternative realities from Rick and Morty, there exists one where they had stuck with the 3374 VCO chip and created a legendary monosynth that fully utilized the various capabilities of the chip. As the 3374 allowed for all kinds of oscillator sync between the two independent oscillators, triangle waveform variable pulse, FM and temperature control pitch correction. All of this is of course only wishful thinking. James, however, assured me that the DB9 prototypes that used the 3374 VCO sounded much deeper and richer. Things that made it into reality were the CV interface and the filter input, both features that were unique for this type of machine, as the base station rack wasn't yet released. The intention behind the filter input was to expand the functionality, so it could also be used as a MIDI gate and the CV interface was added, as many of Music Control's customers used vintage pre-MIDI gate. The units were built by a local electronics company in the UK using through-hole production techniques and quality old-school components that were sourced locally where possible, therefore making DB9 much more expensive to produce. I guess that's also the reason mine, even being a pre-production model, still works perfectly fine after all those years. The whole process from inception to release took only 10 months and the DB9 was in production for 2 years. During my exchange with James, it turned out my DB9 is kind of special because it's a pre-production model and the voice board that houses the CM3340 VCO was built by James himself when they swapped the VCO chip for the 3340. It's a small world after all. Other things that are unique about it are that it doesn't have an X marking on the waveform select that marks the setting for the filter input and the demo tune is slightly different from what you would find in later production models. The high pitched part of the demo you can hear in my first Deep Space 9 video was later removed, which kind of makes sense as this is a bass set. The this demo tune by the way has a history of its own. As James told me it was created by David Morley and John Molloy, who both had ties to legendary label RNS. While John Molloy, who James described as the spiritual father of the Deep Space 9, sadly already passed away two years ago, I found David's homepage, and he was kind enough to tell me the story of how this tune was created at the very last minute at a hotel in my hometown of Frankfurt, Germany during Musikmesse. David and John are also the reason why the Deep Space 9 ended up committing two preset sounds to Emo's dance music rompler Orbit 1990. This way, the humble Deep Base 9 finally found some success, as Imus Orbit Rompler was very successful upon release, and who knows which of your favorite dance tunes from the late 90s included just a little bit of the DS9 too. So, that's it, the story of what mostly seemed to be yet another G303 clone from the early 90s. See you soon with another synth, or possibly the story of its creation.